At the age of 16, Stephen Hinshaw's father experienced the first in a series of episodes that would later be diagnosed as bipolar disorder. He was insane and he was sent to the state facility down the road a little bit where he stayed for the next six months. And as best I can determine, his treatment was to be tied, sometimes chained to his bed at night because he was quite manic at the time, quite paranoid. Uh, he was given no medications. There were no psychotropic medications at that time. Until recent decades, little was known about how to treat psychological disorders. People who were seriously disturbed were hidden away or confined to institutions and treated in ways that look appalling by today's standards. Because they were very fearful for my father's life. He was a muscular kid who weighed you know, nearly 180 pounds and his weight had gone down to 121 and they were about to bring in the clergy to deliver last rites. Somehow, with no treatment other than the custodial treatment he was getting, he started to eat and over the next couple of months slowly regained the weight. He went home and between the middle of March and the middle of June, he finished his entire 11th grade year with a four point grade average. That's bipolar disorder. Utter despair, uh, severely agitated behavior, paranoia, and then suddenly in some cases, with essentially no treatment, everything turns back to normal and the family didn't know what to make of it. Today, the picture is quite different. Thanks to greater awareness of psychological disorders, improved diagnoses, and the variety of effective treatment options that are available. People really do have a wide range of choices. There's lots of therapists out there, lots of physicians out there, and everybody has their own opinions on treatment. Come on in. And what we've discovered is that there is no one-size-fits-all therapy. Rather, we need to be very attuned to fit or matching therapeutic approaches to the given person who's coming for therapy based on what sort of problem this person is seeking therapy for and what sorts of other context factors are important. At the time that Freud was alive, he developed some general ideas about how people work, which he thought were applicable to everybody. Uh, he recognized that people weren't all the same, uh, but he felt that he was a scientist and that he was concerned with the commonalities rather than the tremendous individual differences and that he had discovered this great technique for fixing everybody. Using a technique called psychoanalysis, Freud attempted to discover the origins of his patients' illnesses. Origins thought to be deeply buried in the subconscious. So traditional Freudian talking therapy you look on your own self and try to identify some reason or some core problem which have given rise to your immediate problems. When I first got in the field, uh, even at my own hospital, it didn't matter what was wrong with you, you got to psychoanalyze until you begged for mercy. You know, if you had an eating disorder, you got psychoanalyzed. If you had phobias, you got psychoanalyzed. If you had bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or alcoholism or a geriatric brain syndrome, you were still going to get psychoanalyzed. Kind of like a general hospital that only did kidney transplants. But what happened is the diagnosis got much more precise. And then specific treatment methodologies that targeted specific disorders often involving a combination of medications and therapies could produce dramatic effects. The classic traditional therapy of psychoanalysis is less commonly practiced for a variety of reasons. There are not systematic long-term studies proving the effectiveness of psychoanalysis, at least not in the same way as there are for some of the briefer, more structured psychotherapies. Although James Masterson clearly differentiates his psychodynamic approach from the strict Freudian model, there are some distinct similarities, particularly in the relationship between therapist and patient. I'll make her feel wanted. What we see here is that the issue is really neither Amanda nor the other woman, but your feelings of vulnerability about yourself. I know that. 
I can see what I'm doing, and I can't stop it. You know, it makes this whole exercise seem really pointless. So you're not loving them. You're not taking care of them. You're not their friend. You are their therapist, who is hopefully dedicated to their problem. That's all she knows. When push comes to shove in the treatment, where we have crises, what we are focused on is what do I have to do to create the atmosphere that helps this patient's real self emerge? It would be so much easier to just jump. We consistently stay the course, confronting the destructiveness of this behavior. And then it works. There might be months and months and months in the initial phase, working with the defenses to get therapeutic alliance with the therapist. And now you're working together, the patient is doing the work. And when the patient goes off the main trail, the therapist intervenes to get them back on the main trail. It felt okay. I felt good, even. Humanistic therapists take a different tack, combining active listening with a therapeutic environment that is genuine, accepting, and empathetic. I think if I s stop focusing on everything, like the meals and the structured time and all that thing, and I get wrong. Such unconditional positive regard, Carl Rogers believed, facilitates healing and personal growth. The therapist is not so much as a surgeon who's going to cut things apart, but more like a collaborator who's going to help liberate the inherent drive for healing that the mind and the brain have. Behavior therapists, however, doubt the healing power of talk therapies. They are more interested in action-oriented techniques, particularly in treating anxiety disorders. You are going to change uh, difficult behavior by talk alone. People need to confront the problems they face. You need to enable them to master them and it's through master experiences that you'll have the, uh, the powerful therapeutic effect. There's an element of exposure treatment in virtually all, not all, but virtually all forms of treatment. And by itself, I think it's the single most effective ingredient. Uh, I think I'm ready. The first thing you model. Secondly, you break it down into small manageable tasks so that you never ask them to do anything that they couldn't do with a little extra effort. If they still can't do it, you have joint performance. You do it together. And then you gradually fade on uh, your participation. And if they still can't do it, you use graduated time. Can you do it for a second? And then as they get a little more confident, and you extend it. And then you give them assignments to do um, on their own to uh, convince them that their success is due to their restored capability rather than because the therapist is around. For obsessive compulsive disorder, you get the person to expose themselves to all these things that provoke their obsessions. And then you get them to not make their compulsive ritual. They think they're going to go just off the planet with anxiety if they can't perform their ritual because they think that it's only through performing the ritual that they can get rid of this intense distress provoked by the obsessive thought or image. But what they find is that as they get prolonged exposure to these things that provoke their obsessions and they don't complete the ritual, they find that in a matter of 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, their um, urge to engage in this ritual begins to subside. Close your eyes and tell yourself, stop. Stop. My issue with the behavioral approach to treating obsessive compulsive disorder is that people understand that these thoughts and urges don't really make sense. And so it seems to me only logical, only common sense, if you will, to use that knowledge as part of the treatment. The idea of combining cognitive therapy with behavioral treatments has proven effective for many anxiety disorders. Cognitive behavior therapy rests on certain basic assumptions. The cognitive side, uh, the idea there is people act the way they act and feel the way they feel because they think the way they think. And thinking is essentially a form, for most people, of self-talk. So you teach people, the old joke used to be you went to a shrink because you talked to yourself. Now you go to a shrink to talk to yourself and make sure you're saying the right things. 
The focus of cognitive behavior therapy is to help people unlearn the patterns that tend to maintain a disorder. And so in some ways it's not focused on how you got there, but once you're there, once you're in disorder status, how do you get out? And it's a very learning-based focus. You want people to use mindful awareness, or what I often call the impartial spectator function, to say to yourself and see and understand the only reason I feel afraid is because my brain is sending me a false message. I have obsessive compulsive disorder and the obsessive compulsive disorder interacts with this object, this, this dirty object in ways that make me feel very afraid. But there's nothing really to be afraid of. Within the context of that understanding, the fear subsides and then it's not merely an extinction of fear. It's, a, it's an active process. You take a disorder like panic disorder. When people come to us, they've had the disorder on average for a decade. Ten years between the start of the disorder before they get to a specialty clinic. And if we do a, a standard series of treatment, we have about a dozen sessions with them that are 50 minutes each. There's no way that we're going to be effective in that treatment unless we co-opt the other 99% of their waking time. My job is to teach you about the disorder, teach you about the change process, so you can make me redundant. Not all therapy is conducted on an individual basis. Group and family therapy often adds a valuable dimension. I wouldn't be yelling if you would just sometimes pay attention and sometimes listen. Let's have the group members learn from each other and let's use the actual process of being with other people to allow you to discover things about yourself. When you talk, how you talk, what you react to, as a safe environment for discovery. That's one take on group therapy. Another take is, let's offer treatment in a way that's efficient and cost-effective. Family therapy um, recognizes that problems reside within individuals, but also between individuals, and that if we're gonna get maximum leverage for difficult problems people are struggling with, that we want to uh, hit at both parts of it. You don't just see the individual person and what's inside his or her head or his or her heart, but you appreciate it in the context of other things going on in the family. So you think about if one person's depressed, what impact that has on the other people in the family, but also what else is going on in the family that might be associated with the depression. Even if I'm seeing an individual patient, I'll always see their family also and make some decision about what's going to be the most efficient way to help the person with what it is they're struggling with. It would be natural to extrapolate, well, I mean, you and I can sit and have a very wonderful, intensive conversation, but if there were four of us sitting here, it would be diluted. But that misses the mark on what family systems therapy is about. It's really about the connections between the individuals and how they all fit together. Whatever approach is used, the larger question for many people is, does psychotherapy really work? Huge question and issue in psychology over the last half century. Partly because, first of all, people get better. If they're anxious, if they're depressed, time elapses, they get better, whether they have therapy or not. If they do have therapy, they will tend to attribute their improvement to the therapy. But the question is, are they improving more or are they more likely to improve than if they have no therapy whatsoever? And the answer from the corpus of available research seems to be yes, somewhat. Psychotherapy is an interesting topic for bringing in the bright lights of science and the scrutiny that science brings because it is such a richly interpersonal interaction, private with confidentiality. At the same time, if we don't study it, we make all kinds of mistakes over and over again. Without research, I would never know what your ultimate outcome was. Yes, we have followed the uh, teenage girls and their families who were part of our program. And I guess what I would say is, if you think in psychology about the one-third, one-third, one-third rule, which is one-third of the people get better, one-third of the people stay the same, and one-third of the people get worse, we do better than that. The ones who get better don't seem to get depressed again. 
seem like they get into a better social world, their family relationships improve, they feel good about themselves. <laughs> terms of post-traumatic stress disorder, its treatment works, is helpful. There's some question about, you know, this funny word cure. I don't think that that's appropriate any more than it is, say, right now for someone with diabetes. But certainly management and modification from real difficulty with symptoms to very little difficulty is certainly possible and has certainly occurred many, many times. The therapeutic approach that is used may not be the only factor influencing treatment outcomes. There's been research that has shown, for example, group therapy studies have been compared um, where you use group therapy technique A versus B versus C versus D looking at psychological outcomes. And what determines whether there's a beneficial outcome is not the nature of the therapy, but the nature and style of the therapist. Uh, I would say that the single most important thing about choosing a good therapist is finding someone who you really feel you can talk to and, and you feel is, is listening to you. The sense of making a connection and the sense of that there's someone helping you understand what's going on, that you're not just doing it totally on your own. Make sure the person is licensed and properly credentialed. Uh, at a minimum, you want that. Although that's hardly any guarantee. It's like plumbers or electricians, you know, they're really bad ones and then the average ones and then the very good ones and the, the pool of very good ones is small. You've really got to do your homework. In selecting a therapist, the cultural competence of the person may be important to consider. So cultural competence is a big term right now because you say, if I'm trying to help you with your mental health, I need to understand the context of your life to make the proper interpretations of things that you might say or reasons why you might do things that may not make sense in some other scheme. Culturally competent means understanding the culture of the people that you're working with, knowing about your own culture, how those two cultures might interface, how they might be similar, how they might be different, how your value systems might be similar or different. A question that often comes up has to do with whether or not you should talk about race when you're working with someone. And what we try to do is to encourage people to, in a sense, deal with the elephant in the room. Clients come in hoping to get guidance from their therapist about these kinds of issues. And if he or she won't talk about them, that communicates the message that this must be so bad that even my therapist won't talk about it. It's not enough just to belong to the same cultural group. That seems to give you some advantage, but you, know, you can be very upper middle class and be black and not be able to understand the context of a poor black person's life. So it's a really um, important subject. In recent years, biomedical therapies have joined psychotherapies and revolutionized treatment, especially for severe mental illnesses such as bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Prior to the 50s, the typical treatment was institutionalization and confinement. And in the context of the institution, the main concern was to control the patient, to keep them from hurting themselves and other people. When the first antipsychotic drugs were introduced in the 1950s and came into more widespread use in the 50s and 60s, there was a real revolution in treatment. All the drugs that we have now uh, were originally stumbled on uh, accidentally. Um, th the best example is the Thorazine, which was the first really useful drug for the treatment of schizophrenia. So this is a drug that came out of work to control allergies, stuffy noses, or runny eyes, allergic reactions of various kinds. It turned out that in addition to blocking the chemical called histamine, which is what they were developed for originally, 
it also blocked a different chemical, which is very prominent in the brain, called dopamine. And by blocking certain actions of dopamine in the brain, the drugs turned out to be very useful for diminishing and sometimes completely relieving some of the paranoid ideas and the voices that they heard and the delusions that they had. All of the first generation are what we call typical antipsychotics such as Thorazine had the potential side effect of movement disorders. But the newer medications seem to be more effective not only in dealing with what we call the positive symptoms like the hallucinations and delusions, uh, but also dealing with the negative symptoms, the social withdrawal, the lack of emotion. One gets different specific effects in different individuals, depending on their mood at the time, depending on their innate chemistry, depending on the variations in specific protein structures in their brains, etc. So that it's actually quite amazing that when you take this chemical, psychiatric medication, that it does anything good at all. And I do kind of stumble and fall, but with the help of my medications, um, I don't fall so far and stay so long. And when I was put on lithium many years ago, I was put on at a very high level of lithium because that's what the standard of medical care was. And it was what was necessary in order to get my mania in line. Um, it was very blunting and very um, disturbing and uh, upsetting to me to have to reconcile myself to the idea of being on any kind of medication at all, and also one that had very, very deep side effects. I'm on a much lower dose now, which is much more standard care now for people to be at lower doses. And I don't feel, you know, uh, particularly inhibited at all. I don't feel that I'm blunted or adult. And um, I think many of my colleagues wouldn't mind seeing me at higher dose, you know. <laughs> the net effect for most people is desirable, and that's why we prescribe them. But we fully understand that there are side effects that individuals experience vary vary from person to person. This is true for other medicines too. I mean, there are people who have idiosyncratic reactions to um, aspirin. If you have cancer, uh, as my late husband used to say, you don't hesitate to take drugs that are absolutely devastating in their effects because you want to save your life and you know that that's your only choice to save your life. And the problem in psychology and psychiatry is that people don't treat these illnesses for what they are, which is that life-threatening. The suicide rate is extremely high in schizophrenia and in and, uh, bipolar illness and depression. And so if you think about it from that point of view, and certainly from my perspective as somebody who nearly died because of my illness, um, I don't have the luxury of thinking about side effects so much. It's either take medication or be dead or be on the back wards, and those aren't attractive alternatives. But if there's any degree of complication, which there usually is, the medication alone won't be enough. And if you look at the studies, the well-controlled uh, multi-site field studies sponsored by NIMH, National Institutes of Mental Health, they almost always say the same thing, that the best outcome is the combination of good psychotherapy and medications for right, no virtually any disorder that you want to look at. Getting people into treatment is one of the hardest things that there is in, in psychiatric and psychological practice. Um, keeping people in treatment is almost harder. I certainly went on and off my medications and it cost me, nearly cost me my life and it certainly cost me a lot of years of my life and it's something I regret enormously. In some ways, the patient is the last person to know they're getting better. That is, the patient may come in and say, this medicine isn't working. No, yesterday I went out and did my chores in the yard and I went shopping and I just felt like uh, I couldn't go on. Whereas the week before they were not doing anything but lying in bed. So sometimes the patient doesn't recognize that they're getting better. Commonly the first things to improve are symptoms such as sleep, anxiety, energy. Mood can lag behind. It's a matter of getting the patient to stick with the treatment long enough for the antidepressant effects to kick in. 
psychotherapy is vital in this. Uh, there is a tendency over time, if it's, if it's untreated, for the illness to get worse, for the episodes to become more frequent and more extreme and more difficult to treat. So one of the many very compelling arguments for staying on medication is, first of all, not to do so, you take big hits to the brain. I mean, serious biological hits to the brain. The great thing about these medications is that when they're working, they prevent future episodes. So they prevent that progressive aspect of the disease. Some of the medications that are available, like lithium and Depakote, seem to, and some of the antidepressants, seem to reverse some of the damage and actually cause, their neurotropic, they t seem to actually cause neuronal growth. And indeed, uh, th there is a, a enormous interest in the concept and phenomenon of neurogenesis, which is exactly the, the production of new cells, new neurons in the brain. With the aid of neuroimaging technology, therapists may not only optimize biomedical choices for their patients and track their progress, but also target the chemistry of the brain areas involved in specific symptoms. So, although currently psychiatry still rely on a try-by-error approach, meaning that different uh, treatment approaches are tried, and weeks later uh, the, the physician uh, will find out if uh, the treatment was successful. Um, I'm convinced that in the year to come we will be able to supplement these uh, um, informed treatment decisions with information gathered from genetics as well as uh, neuroscience. Looking back at the experiences of those who suffered from mental illnesses just a few decades ago, you get a sense of just how far we've come. Yeah, there was a lot of uh, very pointed and poignant uh, memories I have of my dad's later years. First, the relief he had and really expressed to me that lithium really took some of the edge off and gave him the sense that he wasn't waiting around for the next episode. Yet at the same time, by the time he finally got on lithium, near 60 years of age, it was late in the game. Already, he was not the same as he had been early in his career. A brilliant philosopher. So it was bittersweet. Inside Out is a 22-part series about psychology. For information on this program and accompanying materials, call 1-800-576-2988 or visit us online.